probably seriously since 2001. Um, now, what I'm doing tonight actually is mainly focused on family history and not local history, so that's the second disappointment. Um, but I suppose a lot of what, you, what I found probably in the last maybe five years, five or six years, in doing family history myself, because uh, as you're probably all aware, it's something you, it's a continual thing that you, you take up, you put away, you take up again. But I suppose I found that, and probably all of us, um, that you exhaust uh, the actual family and then you become somewhat more interested in the place. And that's where I suppose local history comes into it, in looking at the place. Um, I suppose I took it to an extreme. I did. Um, I did a, a, the local studies um, course in UCC, the evening course, and I, I did it based on the townland um, that my father was from, so uh, that was really taking it to extreme. So local studies, I suppose, um, let's get it going, it's a bad start. Um, so that's just a brief overview of, of local studies. I suppose the, the important thing to think about local studies is that uh, it's always been an integral part of Cork County Library. Um, from the very beginning um, there was an emphasis on the importance of, well at that time I suppose it was more the reference library, um, and that's continued down through the years, um, culminating probably in the appointment of Tim to uh, the position in local studies, but that's been maintained, I suppose, and our current county librarian has a, um, a great interest in local studies, and as a result, I suppose, um, we're very fortunate in that respect, in that um, we would have a very good budget for f buying books, and that's, that's really what our main collection is, it's, it's books, it's secondary source material. Um, what do we have? I, the, the, the unique collection is the Cork collection, uh, but we also have an Irish collection. We, c um, we get periodicals and historical journals. Um, we have microfilm holdings, which aren't probably as important as they once were. Um, we have public computers, which are probably more important because an awful lot of, particularly for family history, a lot of the resources are available online. We're very fortunate, as was in Ireland, that uh, most of them aren't behind paywalls, unlike in other jurisdictions. Uh, we have the ITA files, they're Irish Tourist Association files from the 1940s, quite a unique collection. Um, probably more in interesting to the social historian than the family historian. Um, with the Cork Place then survey, again, if you find that you're, you, you become quite interested in the place that your ancestors came from, that, that's quite important. Um, we have genealogy files. I suppose they were created kind of, um, they would have been more important probably 30, 40 years ago pre uh, computerization. So somebody would have wrong, or something wrong, they would have largely have written to the local studies library with a query, and then somebody would write back, and then they'd write back again. So you could have a correspondence over six to nine months. So those files are still there. Now, obviously, if you're interested in a particular surname, we can't necessarily give you access to it because of GDPR, but we can let you look at the information that would have been gathered at the time to answer the query. Uh, we have maps, um, newspaper collections, very important, this was for the family historian, um, rare books and photographic collections. Again, I suppose photographs, I find you can be gathering dates and you can know when somebody was baptised, when they were born, when they died, when they were married. But it's fantastic to get a photograph of somebody. And I suppose some of the photographic collections, um, we've one from Yall from the early 20th century, and no doubt people would, um, there would be people's relations there. We recently were, do, uh, a collection uh, was donated to us from Mallow, um, a photographer there, an amateur photographer. Um, he was been photog phot photographing for the last 60 years and he donated it, his entire um, collection to us. Uh, we also have the website, which is worth taking a look at, because we put material up on there quite a lot. So the Cork Collection, um, as I say, it's mainly books. Uh, we try and make an effort to, to purchase any book that's published by a Cork author, by a Cork publishing house, uh, about Cork. Um, 
or about any uh, subject related to Cork. And that could include something as diverse as sport, uh, cookery, uh, I suppose all those things, while they might not be immediately interesting now, but in 50 years' time, a cookery book can tell you a lot about the social history, how it's changed. Um, so I'm just going to give you a few examples of books. Um, I'll go through, I, I, I timed this, but I think it's over an hour, so I'm going to go through it a bit quicker than I had intended. Uh, so I just, this is some examples of just recent books now that we got. Um, and as you can see, they're quite diverse. You can have books that are published, self-published by families. Uh, that spins one there. Uh, it's about a couple in Domainway. Um, you know, principal houses, uh, that's about a family and their trip to America. But also we collect books um, about uh, sources of information or archives. And they're very useful if you're starting out because sometimes, I know I used to go to the National Archives originally before a lot of the material became available. And it would have been great to have a how-to guide for going there because they can be quite intimidating places to go into some, uh, some of the archives. Not the local studies, obviously. Um, so there's a few more. Uh, <laughs> very fortunate I put that one in. <laughs> I should have showed you that before we started. <laughs> so there's a few, obviously we have quite a few that are specifically on family history. Um, and again, they're great to, uh, I remember actually buying the Irish Roots one when I was starting out first and doing the pie charts that you had for the family. And it was a great way of just trying to organize, again, pre-computerization. Um, it was all kind of pen and paper, so any kind of tips you got were fantastic. Um, then I suppose you have some that are, uh, this is one on uh, family names of County Cork, and um, it's just on the O'Mahony name, you can see it's quite detailed, that's only two pages, um, I think it's about 17 pages in total. Um, there's another one on um, names of places, um, so I've just highlighted one there. Uh, Valley Varan, so that gives you um, an idea of why the name, um, I suppose if you didn't have Irish, a lot of the names that have been changed into English, it's hard to know what it means, so the likes of this book um, can be very handy. Now, probably a lot that you'll find material online on townlands.ie or log on them as well, which will give you an explanation of um, uh, why a place is named that, no, of course that can be contentious as well, you can have lots of different experts disagreeing on why a place is named. The townland that I did my research on, it's a very small and very insignificant townland, and there's two very different takes on why it was called, what it was called, so. Um, uh, this is one just uh, West Cork and its uh, story, and again this is just actually about um, the O'Mahony's. I, I did a talk to the O'Mahony clan during the summer there, so I have reused some of the slides. Um, this is the place name survey. Um, I suppose it's useful because you've got quite detailed maps. Um, that's of Cool Fada. Um, that's the map, and there's a numbering system there as well. Um, and then, very helpfully, it'll list all the sources. Oops. All the sources for where, for where the name um, came from. So you'll be able to track the changes in the naming of a uh, particular townland down through the centuries. But it'll also give an indication of where you might do some further research yourself. So I just highlighted just a section there on Cavendish Quay, that's in, in Bandon. Um, this is the Directory of Townlands and Dis District Electoral Divisions of Cork. Uh, very useful if you're starting out again and you're trying to figure out because for some of the records, you need to know um, the direct district electoral division. So this book is very, it's, I think it was produced by somebody in Cork County Council. It, it's very useful. Um, so you can get the um, rural districts, the DEDs, the parish, the barony. So again, if you're doing research, um, it's, it's a very, very useful. We have copies of that in local studies. It isn't available online um, as yet. Um, this is one just the Irish and the Anglo-Irish landed gentry. Again, if you're doing research on a, on a place, um, it's useful to know who the um, landlord might have been or who the land was being leased from, um, because then you can start tracking back, um, because uh, unfortunately the records for the, the ordinary um, tenant farmer probably don't go really beyond the 19th century, but you could get, you could 
possibly, if you're very, very lucky, find some information um, on the family that was leasing the land. Um, maybe some of their archives have survived. Um, I've just taken out a piece here of the Roach family, um, just to give you an idea of what's in there and the pedigrees for the Roach family. Um, uh, postal directories, um, again, that we have a collection running from about 1876 onwards, about the 1940s. Um, they're very useful. Um, they give a listing of the towns, villages, and, the, the, and Cork City. Um, just to give you an example there now, I think um, these are butter, butter merchants. I think it's in Bandon. Um, so again, it gives you a sense of how a place has changed over the years. So you could look at it for 1876 and look at it for 1910 and you'll see a big difference in the trades that are carried on in, in the towns and villages. Um, this then is one for Cork City and it's for Anglesey Place. So you get the people who are living there. And I think this one is 1896, that particular guy's postal directory. Uh, our Irish collection then, um, we have a lot of material. We would collect books um, from counties Kerry, Tipperary, Limerick and Waterford. So any counties that are touching on the county of Cork because you'll find that you'll get a crossover, particularly for national events like, let's say, for instance, the, um, the War of Independence now, you'd have had activity on both sides of the border. So it's well worth also expanding out your search into um, if you're, let's say, if you're living in North Cork, maybe looking at records for Tipperary. Um, we have general Irish history as well, which is good to give you a context for national events. Um, and then there's lots of other general um, history, education, archaeology, folklore, travel memoirs. Um, so this is the Census of Ireland. Um, I think it's Pender Census from the mid 17th century. Um, the Barony of Kinnell. I can't read it from here, um, and I've just pulled out. So that'll give you the, the English occupier, and in a lot of cases was an English occupier, but also the principal Irish names. So even though you'll be able to trace your family back probably, well, if you're very fortunate, maybe into the uh, late 18th century, and then there's a big gap between that and... Um, but if you were able to establish the barony, the parish, the townland, this might give you an indication of whether or not the surname you're looking for um, was there in the 1650s. Um, then we have some general books on, on Irish, more general books on Irish families. Um, this is one by Edward McLeiser. Um, and you see, I just picked out three um, Cork, Cork surnames, Beamish, Gould and uh, Creedon. And then there's a few more. Um, histories on, on common Irish surnames. Um, then there's also sort of some unusual ones, the fiends of um, the Tudor sovereigns. Um, and in this particular one I came across, again, this was for the Omani um, clan gathering that I was talking to. Um, it's a pardon to um, this gentleman, Gerald Sutton of Aclair of Balik... Ah, I can't pronounce that. But what I was looking for there was that... Um, the death of Gerald, and he was a Mahony, um, later of Corrimore, County Waterford. So it's, again, it's very early and it's hard to connect your family to this particular family, but I mean, it's as if you can get a connection in the townland, then who's to say that that, that particular Mahony wasn't connected to you if, if Mahony is one of your surnames? Um, then if you're interested, let's say, if, if your ancestor was, uh, had some involvement in um, either the uh, the existing Garda force or the, the predecessors, the RIC um, or the Revenue Police, um, we'd have those books. Um, so this one there is, is the General Register. So that would list all members of the RIC. Um, and what's helpful there is that you'll get, um, you get a, their, their service number and then you can use that to get the um, access to their service record, which will tell you a little bit more about them. Um, and Jim Hurley, who has written three of those, um, he's the person to get in contact if you are looking for the service record. Uh, periodicals and histor historical journals. So I suppose we try and collect any of those that are published in Cork because they're very important 
Uh, you have local historians doing um, history on the ground. Um, if you're lucky, they have done some history on the family you're interested in or the locality. Um, again, this one is just a piece, uh, an article in the Irish Ancestor on the families of a man in counties Kerry and Limerick. Um, and I just highlighted there uh, that particular uh, man. Um, this is another one, uh, the Irish Ancestor. Um, I, I, when I was putting together this, I came across it. I, I've never actually looked at it before, no. Um, it's interesting, it, it, uh, it, this particular uh, article was on uh, immigration to New South Wales and um, it just lists various families by county and this is just the um, Cornelius Dennehy um, and it gives you, you know, he's from Fremont, so uh, again, I suppose when you've exhausted, again like myself, when you've exhausted probably searching for the family at home, like many Irish families there was a lot of emigration, um, I, a lot of my uh, father's family would have emigrated to the United States of America, so it's been quite interesting doing research um, in reverse and trying to track down information on the family um, that emigrated to America and I suppose I was very fortunate in that uh, my father's Great grand aunt, she didn't. She lived to be ninety-four or five or something, and when she died in, um, she died in ooh, one of the Midwest states. But because she was quite old, um, and her daughters were quite involved in the local community, um, the local newspaper had a write-up um, when she died, and it gave quite an extensive history, and it was all correct on where she came from and had the correct townland, had the correct parents, had all the correct dates as far as I could see for her brothers and sisters who had emigrated where, so it was a fantastic resource to get. So, it, it, you know, normally it's going the other way, coming from the, the United States of America back, but in this case. So I wouldn't, if, if you can, find the links there. Sometimes you'll find quite interesting information that you might not have been able to discover here in Ireland. Uh, this one is on the search for missing friends. Um, quite sad. Um, these are just three examples for people from Cork that, that emigrated to the, the US and then went missing. Now they probably didn't go missing in, in most cases, it's just either through um, the fact that maybe their literacy levels were quite low um, or that maybe their parents at home were gone and they didn't write back home. So um, again that can be useful if you are trying to track um, people in the US. Um, journals then, this is the Mallow Field Club Journal. Um, I picked this because there's um, an article there on the Mansfield Bakers of Mallow and the connections to, to Melbourne. Um, and that section there just gives you um, a... So again, you might not have had much information on Pierce Mansfield. Uh, you might not even have had a baptism. Um, so this person has put it together. So it's worth taking a look at the local history journals for your area because um, hopefully somebody might have done some research already for you. There are the genealogy f files that I mentioned, so we have a filing cabinet of those. Um, uh, it's something we probably should uh, spend a bit more time on and extract some of the information from it and put up it on the website because there's some fantastic stories in there. Um, uh, and this is just an example of the Omani file that's in there. Um, and this is to do with the clan gathering, that's why I kind of picked it out again, um, but it actually even contains photographs, so... Um, and I think there's a list of who those people are as well, actually, in the, in, on the back of the photograph, so it's, it's to be a nice resource to have if you were doing research on the Omani family. Uh, magazines, we subscribe to a number of different magazines, uh, Irish Roots, um, there's a section of surnames, I just picked out a few, very good one on visiting archives. Um, so again, before you visit, somebody else has done, done the work, so you kind of realize what you need to have, maybe where the parking is. Are you allowed to use Byron inside that? Do you need to bring your own paper? Um, and that's also a section there on DNA. Actually, I heard an interesting story. I have a, f a friend of, our, of mine lives in um, Iceland. And Iceland has done an extensive DNA um, survey of its entire population. Now the population is only about 280,000 and I think most of the people there can go back to the, the Middle Ages. But um, 
it's becoming a bit of a concern um, in the society there that because younger people are not as aware of their, their lineages and who they're connected to, that um, I suppose the authorities are getting a bit concerned that, that people might be hooking up with a relation that's too close to them. So somebody has developed an app and you can, when you're out for a night out, you can tap your phones and the phones talk to each other and they tell you what your relationship is to this person. So before things get serious on the night, you can say, well, no, sorry, we can't, can't. your first cousin, your second cousin, it's not gonna happen, <laughs> which is incredible. Uh, I suppose DNA eventually will allow us to unlock an awful lot, you know, the technology will become such that we won't need to do any research because we'll be able to just feed in our DNA. But at the moment, I know I've got three different sites that I've got to, um, signed up to and there's just because I've got such an extensive um, family in the US and it's probably used most there I, I'd say probably two or three thousand different um, yes yeah they're trying to connect and try and never get through them <laughs> uh, yeah I haven't encouraged any of that <laughs> Uh, this is another one, History Ireland. Um, I just picked out this particular ar article written by uh, a young child. Um, I'd say he's in, in primary school, just on uh, it was a great or great great grand uncle, I think, who took part in this ambush. But he has a lot of the family history there in the article. It's, um, and he obviously did it for a school project. But um, again, you know, somebody could come across that and they could learn an awful lot about their particular family uh, just by chance. Uh, newspapers, um, I suppose traditionally the newspapers we would have had, um, particularly the examiner, we had available on microfilm. Um, we didn't have the echo, we had some of the provincial newspapers as well on, on microfilm. A lot of them now are available on irishnewsarchive.com. We have a subscription, but most of the public libraries actually have subscription to it. And it's a fantastic resource because you have about 130 odd. Uh, national and provincial newspapers that you can search on that. You can search by search term, by date, you can browse by individual um, newspapers. Um, it's great I suppose if you're trying to, um, a death notice is, is good kind of uh, sometimes. I know we had a query recently, somebody, their m parents, no grandparents, grandparents I think, uh, were not from, from Mallow so they were trying to, and they they didn't know where their grandmother was, was buried. So we were, they did have a death date um, from the death register. So we were looking up and sure enough in the death notice in the newspaper, they said where the, the um, person was taken afterwards to be buried in County Tipperary. So um, uh, the newspapers can be an excellent way of searching for your family. Uh, it's just, it, again, I was talking to another group there yesterday and a thing to remember about the newspapers is an a mistake I made when I started doing it was I was focusing on newspapers from uh, when I was doing the research on the townland in County Kerry. I tended to focus just on the Kerry ones. And I knew something had happened at a particular time um, because I could see it from the petty court uh, records, um, but I couldn't find it in the newspapers. So I just decided I'd expand out and I found um, an account of it in a provincial newspaper from Tipperary. Uh, so sometimes it's worth expanding out your search. Now you do, it's important to limit it maybe to begin with, but if you don't find what you're looking for and you have an idea that it does exist, expand it out and look at the, the counties again that are um, next to County Cork because uh, sometimes another newspaper will have run with the story. Um, so that's just an example there of I just did a search for Omanis um, from the 1940s um, and uh, I was able to find um, there was a, a WM O'Mani, the chairperson um, of a particular thing. So uh, I mean, uh, they're a fantastic resource, but it's time consuming, I suppose, just to, to, to be aware of that. Um, ITA files, I mentioned them earlier, um, uh, they were uh, undertaken in order to uh, create a database of information that would uh, be a, of use to potential tourists to Ireland in the 1940s. Um, 
you know, so it lists lots of various bits and pieces in it, you know, what's available in given towns and, and villages. I think that we have about 92 or 3, maybe or 95 uh, individual files for County Cork. We have digitised them, so they're available on our website um, as PDFs. You can just download them and go through them yourself. Um, Depending on the person who did the survey, uh, some of them were very interested in local history, so they have a lot on the, the history of the town and the surrounding area. So, um, and it's not just confined to the 1940s. Um, some of them would there'd, there'd be multiple pages. So uh, just to give an example there, this is the one for Newmarket. So you can see there's a lot of information in there, um, both on what's available in the 1940s in Newmarket, but also on the history of the, the wider area. So they're well worth taking a look at. Uh, rare books. Um, a lot of them would be from the 19th century. Form, I, geez, I thought I changed that because <laughs> I, I noticed that that should say from the 19th century. Um, we do have some earlier books from the seven, 1600s and the 1700s um, and material that would be of interest to somebody who's um, interested in Cork history. I'll just give you an example there. Um, this one, it's the Cork Rem Remembrancer. It was published by uh, a publisher who was based in Castle Street in Cork in the late 1790s, I think. And he undertook to gather information of interest from, well, he said from the, the beginning of time until um, the late uh, 1700s. Um, now, helpfully, whoever owned this afterwards subsequently they um, marked anything of Irish interest in pencil at the edge and also of Cork interest so there was one that, that I was going through it there a few weeks ago and one that took my interest uh, this case of seven members seven people who were executed in Cork um, I think it the late the, the 1780s um, they had been accused and found guilty of stealing uh, a piece of what was it a piece of linen cloth from the dwelling house of John Terry, one of the sheriffs of Cork. So seven of them were executed, which is extraordinary. So um, there's another one, um, another case of uh, Lawrence Kennedy was executed at Gallows Green, Cork, um, and there's another one. Matthew Callaghan, unfortunately, there's a lot of, for Cork, there's a lot of uh, executions seem to be mentioned, as was there of note. Um, so again, uh, something that's well worth taking a look at. Uh, we have a local history card index, this predates computerization, so we'd have a lot of information there on uh, loads of different subjects, individuals, places, events, uh, unusual occurrences in Cork. Uh, so this research would have been done um, by one of the staff in local studies in response to a query and then they would have made a note of it in an index card because they, you know, in case that somebody then would have asked about it afterwards. I suppose well, that's kind of, we do no longer use them, we no longer fill them out because we would have digital files now and so we just keep a digital file of something that we think might be of interest to um, somebody uh, going forward. So let's just give an example there of um, just some of the names from Cork. Um, uh, we're currently digitising that ourselves or creating a, um, a spreadsheet of it so that we can search it more easily ourselves because it's quite, quite densely packed. Um, microfilms, we, th some people still use them. Um, I suppose we do have some unusual collections on them that aren't available anywhere else, maybe except in the National Library, some of the old newspapers. Um, we'd also have uh, some of these, all of these probably now are, in, are available probably on Irish Genealogy or Roots Ireland, uh, these, these particular collections, they're, they're parish registers, um, but they wouldn't have been readily accessible 20 years ago, so uh, that's why they probably were, were scan um, a microfilm was created. And, um, then you've kind of random stuff, uh, Kinsale manuscripts and Rochford family maps. Um, then there's Trinity College Library um, that's to do with some family and then there's the Baltimore Industry Fishing School. Um, so a lot of the material I suppose that's, that's available there is, is now probably available online but there, there would be a one or two unusual collections. Um, and then we would have a lot of probably older uh, users who still prefer to use the microfilm to do the search rather than new, use Irish News Archive. Um, so uh, we, we still have three f um, microfilm machines that, that, that are going, so you're, you're more than welcome to come in and take a look at the collections. There might be something there that would be of interest. Um, 
We have maps, um, I suppose, uh, the, uh, one of the more significant ones we would have a copy of the, the original uh, first edition OSI map for County Cork. That would have been used subsequently for Griffith's valuation, so um, it, it, it's, uh, I suppose, a unique snapshot of Cork. Um, it's about 1840, I think, or something. Now, again, that is available to view online through the OSI website. Um, but sometimes it's great to be able to look at the large sheet on, on a research desk inside because uh, it gives you a better appreciation of a larger area. Sometimes when you're just zooming in on a map, you kind of might miss something. So um, We also have 19th century ordnance survey maps for, for a number of towns. Um, we have a lovely map um, from 1846, uh, part of the Standish Barry Estates in East Cork. Um, it's, uh, it looks like it's hand drawn, but it's just that also has a list of tenants from that time. So that's that's quite unusual, and that if you know if you were interested in the history um, of East Cork, that certainly would be of interest. Um, we have the Ponsonby estate maps as well, and we have some others as well. Uh, that's uh, just a, a screenshot of our website. Uh, we redeveloped our website recently, so we've tried to make it kind of, I suppose, more, more um, I suppose, as websites um, develop and change, uh, you need to keep, keep up, upgrading them. Um, I suppose we have put a lot of our collections up there, particularly our photographic collections. Um, so we also have information collections, exhibitions, resources, displays, uh, maps, historical journals. Some of uh, some historical journals they, they have allowed us to scan and digitise each copy, so that's up there. Um, we have some podcasts. We have problems with podcasts at the moment because the site that's hosting them there's an issue with it. But um, uh, we have been putting together podcasts of just various aspects of Cork history. Um, oh. Uh, uh, we have some Catholic parish records. Um, uh, some of them are in printed form, they're transcribed, and then also we have a database uh, so we can do the search for you. Um, uh, we also have one or two burial records. Um, we have an original for Kilmurray and a transcript, uh, I think, for Corakapan. Um, I suppose if you're interested in that, Cork City and County Archives also is worth taking a look at. They'd, they'd have some. Um, Skibbereen Heritage Centre also has um, computerised some of them for West Cork. And um, there would be some uh, when Cork County Council took over um, in the 40s and 50s, I think. Um, you, we would have a listing. Now, it's not up to date, but a listing of, of contacts so if you were interested in finding out what exists for a given um, cemetery or graveyard, uh, you could give us a call or an email and we'll take a look at the list um, to see what exists, or do we have a contact that you can get in contact with. Um, Griffith's valuation, as I mentioned there, we have the original uh, printed volumes. Again, you can, they are free to view on Ask About Ireland. Uh, it's a, the site needs updating. It's quite an old website, and I think they are hoping at some stage to update it. It crashed recently, actually, you couldn't look at um, Griffith's valuation on it. But um, again, it's handy to be able to look at the original because you can look at an entire um, parish, or you can look at the townlands there, so it's worth, we have, we have those inside, um, and then also the maps I mentioned. Um, geez, actually, I've done this in, in record, I've done it too fast, actually. Um, there are opening hours, we're open Monday to Friday, we don't close for lunch, um, you don't need to have an appointment if you want to come in. Um, I see the only thing I'd say is that if you were interested in um, doing some research and you had a particular family or a particular place in mind, it makes it easier for us and it also adds value to your, your, your visit if you give us a call or an email in advance so that we can get, gather some material together for you. Uh, because otherwise, depending at the moment, now we're, we're, there's only two of us working, so um, actually only one of us, um, we're kind of covering two floors. So, you know, to, to maximise your, your trip over, I suppose, it, it makes more sense to, to try get in contact in advance. But you don't need, you can walk in off, off, you don't need to be a member either. 
to use most of the resources and the only one you would need is if you want to use the computers. Uh, thing I didn't mention is that we have access to Find My Past as well um, in local studies so um, that's useful. There's a number of uh, records and that I, I think I mentioned one of the petty courts records uh, that go back to the 1860s. They're interesting uh, particularly if we're looking at the uh, history of, of a townland. Um, when I was doing my research now I found a lot of various bits and pieces on the townland. Um, a lot of it was, uh, it, the name kind of tells you a lot of the cases that were coming up before the magistrate were petty. Um, somebody's cow would stray into the neighbouring farm and they would bring uh, them up in front of the magistrate to complain about it and then two or three weeks later the person who was brought up would complain about the other person doing and this was back and forth uh, and one or two instances the magistrate threw it out he got fed up with the two people that kept coming back but you would also find um, I did found, find information there on um, arson attempts um, also assaults uh, a lot of drunkenness in the public highway um, <laughs> not surprisingly <laughs> So they're worth looking at as well, and they're available through Find My Past, as are dog licenses, I think, which date from the 1890s to about maybe the 1910s. Um, they're available there, and there's some useful indexes as well. I suppose what I've been, I've only given you a snapshot of what we have, and I probably have forgotten some important ones um, when I was, you know, putting this together. Um, so it is worth coming in. Um, to take a look at what we have um, because I suppose as I say the local study stroke reference has been there probably since the 1920s um, so there's an awful lot of material on the history of Cork that's been gathered over that hundred years. Um, we're located there to the right of County Hall as you stand facing the County Hall um, there's car parking then uh, to the right of the building that's usually gone by quarter to eight every morning but there's parking behind which opens about ten o'clock um, and you'll usually find a space there. The only day you won't find space there is actually if the council is in full meeting because the councillors use up all the spaces. Um, there's also probably parking across the road in the Kings Lake but uh, Yes, there is. Yeah. Uh, so if you go to the back of the building, you'll see a multi-storey car park on your right. And just underneath there, there's covered uh, uh, spaces for... Um, for bike. Thank you.